All right. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome back, uh, everyone. Uh, what a great morning. Uh, we hope you're enjoying being here with us today. We're pleased to present this next panel, which is about power for propulsion. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator, a colleague of ours here at the University of Washington, Yuri Shumlan. Uh, Yuri is a professor in aeronautics and astronautics. He has won numerous awards for his teaching, research, and mentoring. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society and associate fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics and a senior member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. He has also co-founded Zap Energy, a spin-out company from the UW to develop commercial fusion um, applications. Um, and I believe that after the panel is done, Amy Sprague will be moderating uh, the Q&A. So Yuri, I'm going to hand things over to you. Thank you very much for uh, your role today. Great. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, so I think um, perhaps um, uh, if I just add one thing, I'm also a, uh, a child of the Apollo Soyuz and the oil embargoes of the 70s. Uh, both of which strongly influenced and shaped my scientific and, and societal objectives uh, for my career. Um, and, uh, and my passions and interests uh, center around uh, plasma technologies, uh, particular fusion energy for, uh, for terrestrial and space applications, um, um, in particular uh, rapid deep space exploration. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here to, to be moderating this panel today on, on power for space propulsion. Um, our panelists um, provide an interesting cross-section of the field, um, each bringing a, uh, uh, an expertise that's highly relevant to the facet of space power. Um, I so look forward to what, what will be a fascinating and informative conversation. Um, and so now I'd like to begin by introducing our, our panelists. Um, and uh, so to begin, um, uh, introduce uh, Roger Myers. Um, he's uh, Chair of the uh, uh, Joint Center for Aerospace Technology and Innovation, Chikadi. Um, he's a longtime leader in aerospace, uh, served on several scientific and executive, served in several scientific and executive roles in Aerojet Rocketdyne. Um, he's uh, served on committees for the National Academies, including recently the Space Nuclear Propulsion for Human Mars Exploration. Uh, he's a fellow of uh, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Uh, so, Longtime friend and colleague, and, and a trusted expert on on any and all space-related technologies. Um, and after this, uh, Roger will be giving us a, a, a brief tutorial. Um, so, Roger, would you like to say hello? Hello, everybody. Uh, it's uh, it's an honor to be asked to do this, and I hope that my uh, tutorial is is good. And and Yuri, are you gonna? Do we do? Should I start now, or are you gonna introduce everybody first? I'm gonna introduce all the panelists first. Perfect. Perfect. Um, and, and so next, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Jess Rogers. Um, she's a legislative and regulatory analyst at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Um, she's an international lawyer specializing in arms control and nonproliferation. Um, she's promoted nuclear arms control policy at the Nuclear Threat Initiative, um, helped implement treaty obligations at the U.S. Department of State Bureau of International uh, Security and Nonproliferation. Uh, serves as an expert for the U.S. Department of Energy, U.S. Department of Defense, U.S. Department of State. Um, she will add what, what I'm sure is going to be a, a vital perspective that uh, contextualizes many of the opportunities and challenges for space power, um, particularly the power needed for, for deep space expert exploration, the high power needed for deep space exploration. Uh, Jess, would you like to say hello? Yeah, thank you, Yuri. Hello, everyone. Very delighted to be on this panel particularly because this year, PNNL and Spark have just entered into a new partnership. So very look, I'm very much looking forward to this cooperation. Great, thank you, Jess. Um, and so next I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Jeff Katalinich, uh, who's a research scientist, uh, research scientist at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Um, he previously was a project manager at an AFRL sp sponsored university satellite project. Um, in his PhD, he specialized in nuclear engineering and applied aerospace engineering, material science, and chemistry. Um, he received the uh, National Science Foundation Graduate Fellowship and the National Defense Science and Engineering Graduate Fellowship, um, after which he joined PNNL 
as uh, Linus Pauling postdoctoral fellow, and he is now a research scientist specializing in national security, material processing, and space nuclear power. Um, he recently received the uh, Ronald Brodzinski Award for Early Career Exceptional Achievement for his work on plutonium-238 soul gel for space heat and power. So congratulations, Jeff. Uh, would you like to say hello? Thank you, Yuri. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Okay, thank you. Um, and so uh, next I'll introduce uh, Jake Leachman, who's an associate professor of mechanical and, um, mechanical and materials engineering at Washington State University. Um, he founded the Hydrogen Properties for uh, Energy Research, the Hyper Laboratory to advance cryogenic hydrogen systems. Um, his interesting is MS research was adopted as the foundation for hydrogen, hydrogen fueling standards and custody exchange. Um, he's uh, received the Roger W. Boom Award from the Cryogenic Society of America. Jake, would you like to say hello? Thanks, Yuri, for inviting the cook to the room. <laughs> Absolutely, my pleasure. <laughs> um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Josh Smith. Um, Josh is a professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Washington, um, specializing in sensor systems and interesting ways to power them with applications for robotics and ubiquitous computing. Um, his current projects include battery-free mobile phones and RF-powered cameras. Josh, would you like to say hello? Sure, happy to be here. Uh, yeah, I'm also a professor in electrical and computer engineering and uh, have a bunch of projects recently related to power and space, a little bit less propulsion, but uh, I'll show you some of what we're doing on power and space context. Great, look forward to it. Okay, and with that, um, I'll turn the floor over to, uh, to Roger Myers, who will give a brief tutorial on the general subject of, uh, of space power. Okay, Roger, take it away. Okay, thank you, Yuri. Appreciate it. I'm gonna pull up my, I'm gonna share a screen, pull up my charts, and people should not panic. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna go through it pretty quickly. But uh, I, I do think it's important for us all to have some context and understand, you know, what it is that the field of space power for propulsion really involves. It's a very broad field. Um, so just when we talk about this, this uh, space, quote unquote, uh, you parse it into spacecraft size. We range from CubeSats to human exploration class missions. You know, CubeSats are, are under 50 watts in many cases. Uh, we have, then we have small sats and medium class satellites that are one to 10 kilowatts. We have large satellites, uh, 10 to 50 kilowatts of electrical power. And of course, then the human exploration class, you know, really big, uh, big exploration missions like human missions to Mars, where there, we're talking about hundreds of kilowatts to, to multi megawatt electric systems. And it's important to realize that today we have primarily flying medium satellites and below. Uh, we have a few satellites at the 20 to 25, maybe topping out at 30 kilowatts of power. We do have the IS, the International Space Station, it, which is the highest power vehicle by far flown in space today, and it's at 200 kilowatts. Uh, those arrays, the, the power system for that is, you know, big enough so that you can see it with binoculars from the ground. So they're very large solar arrays. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about those, those as we go forward. But it's really important to realize that, you know, we fly a lot of spacecraft today and they top out at about 10 to 30-ish kilowatts of, of electrical power. So that's spacecraft size. That's one way to parse it. Then mission type and propulsion system requirements are, you know, it's a different way to look at, at this parameter space. Uh, you know, is it an earth orbit mission, a lunar mission, uh, or is it deep space? And if it's deep space, are you going toward the sun where your power from the sun will increase as you get closer to the sun or away from the sun where the power of course drops as one over R squared from the sun. So we got to understand what the mission type is. And then what are the propulsion requirements? Is this a, a, a flyby mission for deep space? 
where you essentially are just doing attitude control of your vehicle as it goes by your target? Or are you going into orbit, which requires a lot more propulsion to go into orbit and control that orbit? Or even more, are you gonna land on the surface where you need even more propulsion requirement? So again, understanding those, are, it's another key, key uh, set of variables that you need to assess when you're thinking about power for propulsion. And then of course, there's the power supply type. Today, everything we fly almost exclusively, and I'll talk a little bit more about the exceptions are solar arrays with batteries. And you have to have batteries on solar power systems because sometimes you go into shade. Uh, even deep space missions that, for example, today are flying to Jupiter uh, with very large solar arrays to uh, deal with the increased distance from the sun. Um, you have to have a battery system because sometimes it goes behind the planet, the, your, your target planet, and that battery system has to be, has to enable your spacecraft to stay healthy and do its job when it's when the solar arrays are not illuminated. So solar arrays and batteries, they're radioisotope power systems like those uh, on Curiosity uh, or uh, Perseverance, the rovers on Mars. But those same systems are going to fly a, uh, a quadcopter on uh, Titan, the Dragonfly mission. So those radioisotope systems Today, all use plutonium. I'll talk a little bit more about, about that. And there are all kinds of costs and issues associated with using plutonium. And then of course we have the future. Uh, as Yuri mentioned during his intro, I just chaired a, or co-chaired a, 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 a committee with the National Academy looking at fission, uh, propulsion, fission based propulsion systems, either nuclear thermal or nuclear electric. But then of course there are also emerging fusion and beamed energy systems. That those are all pretty futuristic. I mean, I, I don't know if you saw the paper today, but even today uh, for terrestrial power systems, there was a big headline in the Seattle Times that an Everett company, Helion, got uh, a very large, uh, a nice chunk of change uh, for their, their system. So that's very exciting for terrestrial power systems. But applying those systems to space propulsion is a different set of challenges. So I just, again, I'm not going to read everything here, but want to want to emphasize some considerations. Uh, again, for electric propulsion, thrust is proportional to power level. So you need, if you want more thrust, you have to add power. Uh, acceleration is, of course, proportional to thrust divided by mass. This is just Newton's law, and what that means is that trip time for a given mission, the amount of time it takes you to do a certain mission, whatever that mission is, is generally inversely proportional to power divided by mass. So the power to mass ratio is a very important scaling criterion for uh, electric propulsion systems. Another important thing is that electric propulsion is low thrust. These systems have to last a long time. They're not like chemical rockets that fire for seconds or minutes. Uh, they, they fire for hours, uh, days, weeks, even possibly years, depending on, on the particular mission. Uh, and every different system, and I'll give a quick introduction to them, um, to the options, have different performance characteristics. And so what you do is you first parse your mission according to spacecraft size, mission type, requirements, et cetera. And then you look at the options that you have. What are the technology options? What is their, what is their, their uh, current state? How are they qualified? Do they have flight heritage? Are they, you know, et cetera. Um, okay, so that's on the propulsion side. On the uh, power side, you have solar cells. Well, solar cells today are 25 to 32% efficient, give or take, depending on uh, how much money you're willing to spend and the cover glass uh, requirements. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, solar power drops inversely as the square is a distance from the sun. So you got to think about those factors uh, as you are designing, as you are picking your power system, uh, if it's a solar power system. Radioisotope power generators last a long time and, of course, do not depend on solar illumination. So they're great in the shade, but you only get about 100 watts from the state of the art. Uh, radioisotope generator. They use thermoelectrics and um, they use plutonium and thermoelectrics are not very efficient. 
So uh, you know, you're talking about seven to ten percent conversion efficiency of the thermal energy in a typical uh, radioisotope power converter that exists today. Um, they use plutonium, and plutonium has all kinds of regulatory issues. Uh, all kinds of challenges associated with it. It's very toxic. Um, it's, it's dangerous, very dangerous stuff. And then of course, there are fission reactors. Well, you know, much as we like to talk about the wonders of the potential for nuclear power in space, the United States has flown one in its history in 1965. And we have not flown a fission reactor since then. Very important to realize that the technology maturity for fission reactors, I don't care which, what the application is, either nuclear thermal or nuclear electric, um, is you know that technology is not very mature. And there are lots of risks and opportunities. And I refer you to the, to the National Academy's report for, for more details. I'll talk a little bit about it. The Soviet Union, by contrast, has flown a few. Fusion and beamed energy systems have received very limited funding for basic research for propulsion. For power systems, they've gotten a lot more. Uh, and, you know, Yuri has done some outstanding work at the University of Washington and the Zap Energy. Uh, and, the, you know, there are lots of companies looking at terrestrial power systems. And there are several universities looking at the potential for fusion based propulsion. So now I'm going to quickly go through. Uh, some propulsion system op a little bit more detail on the propulsion and power systems and then uh, and then the tutorial tutorial will be over so just really quickly I'm, i want to highlight here the diversity of options for very low power electric propulsion systems right we range from electrospray colloid field emission there are pulse plasma thrusters of different types uh, lots of them are flying today on cubesats uh, or very small spacecraft um, Hall thrusters are, are flying uh, today, very, very small ones, uh, and there are many companies and universities working in this area. So um, again, there are several, you got to remember, every they are not interchangeable for different missions. Uh, for I'll give you a specific example. Uh, Hall thrusters have lower specific impulse. Um, but higher thrust at a given power level than, for example, field emission thrusters. Field emission has very high specific impulse, but lower thrust uh, than a Hall thruster. And so you've got to understand what your mission requirements are in order to make a selection. Similarly, in the one to 10 kilowatt power range, there are, again, lots of options. The uh, SNECMA PPS 5000, I pictured it here, uh, launched two weeks ago on a French military communication satellite for the first time. So very exciting for Stekma and that team. Uh, uh, the NASA, the Aerojet Rocketdyne, you know, just here in Redmond, uh, their, uh, ion their gridded ion thruster operating at seven kilowatts of power will launch next month, uh, this month, on the DART mission. So that, that uh, propulsion option will be uh, flying in a month. Um, there are several uh, options here that have flight heritage. Uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne has flown the XR5. I don't even put a picture of that here. That was actually a system that I led the development of. Um, and there are 40 or 50 of those flying. So again, lots of options. Um, as we go to higher power, there are fewer and fewer options. Uh, right now, Aerojet Rocketdyne in Redmond is developing a 13 kilowatt hall thruster. And uh, they also worked with the University of Michigan on the 100 kilowatt uh, Hall thruster. Uh, Ad Astra, led by Franklin Chang Diaz, has the Vasimir thruster. And there was some work at the University of Washington on the field reverse configurations. So all, all good stuff. And then Princeton and the University of Stuttgart uh, have, have done a, a lot of work on uh, MP, uh, applied field or just magnetoplasma dynamic thrusters. Um, again, as we go to higher and higher power, there are fewer and fewer options. Why? Because there are fewer and fewer missions. So there isn't the pull. The market is not pulling in, the, in this direction yet. It's just starting to. Uh, so primarily, this is university research or, or a small company. 
So now switching gears to the power side, I mentioned already the solar power, you know, typically between 27 and 32% efficiency, but there, are, there is theoretically opportunity for over 50% efficiency in solar, solar cells. That would be super exciting and truly game-changing if that, if that happens. But there are some real important things. Radiation degradation as you know, one of the challenges of Earth space is that we have the Van Allen belts. And if you use solar arrays to move up and down through the Van Allen belts, you take about a 10% hit in the performance of a solar array every time you transition the Van Allen belts. It's sensitive to cover glass, uh, does cover glass selection, et cetera, but it's a significant factor for many missions. It's one of the big challenges of Jupiter solar cell, solar arrays. Lots of work going on now in array mass reduction. It's not just about the solar cells, but about the array structure, how you package these enormous solar arrays and how you deploy them. Can, are they flexible? Those kinds of questions. I've shown here a picture of a CubeSat with body mounted solar arrays. And then this is a much larger, this is actually a rollout solar array where the solar array is rolled up into a tight package and it unfurls after launch. And then here's the International Space Station, whoops, with all of its, uh, with all of its large, enormous solar arrays. And batteries are very important. They're a significant fraction of the mass of, a, uh, of any spacecraft power system. You gotta worry about radiation tolerance, thermal management, right? They get hot when you dis when you release the energy. So radioisotope power. Again, I'm trying to go fast and just introduce you to this uh, very broad topic. Um, state of the art is the MMRTG. It's built by the US government and Aerojet Rocketdyne. Aerojet Rocketdyne actually uh, does the manufacturing of it. And here it's pictured on the Perseverance rover as the Perseverance rover is, uh, is lowered to the surface of Mars. Uh, and you can see how big it is relative to this person in the, in the top picture. Um, there are some propulsion concepts that use MMR, the RTGs. The problem is the RTG is very heavy and not very efficient and only produces about 100 watts of power. So you're talking about the low end of those power, of those propulsion options that I showed. There are some new uh, technologies for RTGs. There's some new, more efficient uh, thermocouples to produce the power. And there's a dynamic power conversion system that has been proposed. Uh, a lot of work happened about 15 years ago. That program did not succeed. Now it's coming back because technology has advanced and, and we hope it will. I did wanna point out a Seattle-based uh, new concept, which is very exciting. And that's using non-plutonium isotopes. So other isotopes that are short life, but much higher power density. And this was recently funded by NASA through their uh, NIAC program. And it's here uh, at the um, Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation here in Seattle. And they have proposed a uh, extrasolar object interceptor. In fact, if you, you can read, read about this online, it's, uh, the capabilities are, are amazing actually. If it, it's very low TRL, but it is a very exciting innovation in radioisotope power systems. Fission concepts. Um, there are two nuclear thermal rockets where, and, and Jake Leachman will tell us about the challenge of storing hydrogen to support a nuclear thermal rocket. But fundamentally, a nuclear thermal rocket is like a chemical rocket, except you've replaced the combustion chamber with a nuclear reactor. The challenge is that you, you have to have an extraordinarily hot reactor and it has to achieve that temperature very rapidly, stably as you're flowing the hydrogen through it. There are lots of, there are, and also we have to test it. How are we gonna test a nuclear reactor? I'm sure that one of the other panelists will talk about the challenge of testing fission, fission systems on the ground and then launching them. They, I, I should uh, remind everybody that fission systems will be launched cold. They will not, they will have at most undergone a few seconds of testing. So the uh, radionuclide products in the fission reactor prior to launch will be very, very small. So uh, they're, they're at a, they're, it's pretty low risk to launch fission reactors. And, and I would contrast that to plutonium reactors where the plutonium is quite 
quite nasty. So, but the test options are very limited. How do you qualify these systems, et cetera? And as I said, Jake will tell us about multi-year storage of liquid hydrogen to support that. Then there's the nuclear electric option, offers even higher performance, even fewer launches, um, but it's a more complex system. Instead of having a simple uh, thing that looks like a chemical rocket, you've got a reactor or a power conversion system. You've got to manage the power. You're talking about a few megawatts of power. You've got to reject all that heat. So enormous radiators are involved. And then you have the electric propulsion system in addition to that. So there aren't the fundamental challenges, the materials and testing challenges that you have with nuclear thermal rockets, but there are a larger number of potentially small, of maybe smaller challenges. So that contrast, again, we talk about it quite a bit in the National Academies report, and I, I refer you to that for more details, because I'm sure Yuri wants me to finish up. Um, longer term, there's fusion. And you know, as I mentioned, there was a big headline today uh, in the Seattle Times, you know, great work going on terrestrial power system, but working on take, converting those systems from terrestrial power to space propulsion is a, is a challenge in and of itself. Um, but there is work going on. URI's done some, Princeton, Wisconsin, University of Alabama, Huntsville. There are several, or, several universities looking at fusion systems. And primarily we're focused on a neutronic fusion. Uh, and I, Perhaps somebody will talk about that, another one of the panelists, and there are both pulsed and steady state systems. If this can be solved, if these challenges can be solved, of course, fusion would be truly revolutionary. And there are several um, basic research efforts ongoing now that if successful, uh, it, would be, it, it would be amazing and, and very exciting. And then we have the last con concept that I'm gonna talk about, beamed energy. Uh, it's been proposed for everything from launch, that's what this picture is here, uh, uh, using a laser beam to heat gas in, inside a, uh, an open nozzle, um, to interstellar propulsion, and that's what the image is down below. Uh, you can use it in several ways. You can use it uh, to convert the beamed energy to electricity and use it for electric propulsion. You can heat the propellant directly, or you can impart momentum just through photon uh, reflection uh, onto a large uh, light sail. So there are lots of ways of, of doing it, but there are also huge challenges. And right now, these are very um, immature concepts. They're, um, again, they're very interesting physics, but uh, making any of these beamed energy, I done quite a bit of work in this area myself and uh, have not succeeded in finding a way to make it work. Uh, so, uh, I, but again, if we can resolve those challenges, it's a great opportunity. So to summarize, just hearkening back to the very beginning of this tutorial, when assessing power for propulsion, it's critical to remember how big is your spacecraft that you're talking about and what are the propulsion requirements that, you, that you're trying to satisfy and what are my power system options, right? And there are solar, radioisotope, and fission potentially. How near term are we talking, right? All of those questions come to bear. Uh, there's lots of current capability, but it's all solar and batteries. There's emerging work. There's a lot of new technology being developed, but it's low technology readiness level. So we have a lot of work to do in order to de finish development, testing, validation, qualification, and then go into production. Very exciting uh, opportunities with many of the advanced concepts. So that's my tutorial. I hope I at least set the stage for some of the other discussions. Thanks. Thank you, Roger. That was, that was really great. Um, yeah, I, I think you did an excellent job of, of really establishing the foundation and, and it's really gonna set the context for, for our panel discussion. Um, so, I mean, you, you touched on many uh, interesting topics there. Um, so I think I'd like to turn over to, to Jess for an opening statement, I think in particular in the context of some of the, the uh, challenges that you laid out for, uh, for testing and, and, uh, um, and just uh, flying nuclear uh, 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 materials. So, so Jess, would you like to make an opening statement? Thank you, Yuri. And thank you, Roger. 
So like Roger said, power for propulsion is a very broad field. And I'd like to take a closer look today at the use of nuclear thermal propulsion for deep space exploration, which Roger already correctly said comes with several risks. So the reason I'd like to look at this is because uh, for propulsion, NASA is initially focused on nuclear thermal systems. And in this technology, um, so Roger already uh, gave a brief summary, the heat generated by the reactor is transferred to burn hydrogen fuel in rocket engines. And so the thrust is similar to that of the conventional liquid fuel rockets we have today, but it has the potential to double the fuel utilization efficiency. So that's why it's uh, really attractive for use to getting us to Mars. So there are a few missions like these deep space missions, which um, a lot of people believe we will need nuclear propulsion for. It's just, it's faster and more efficient. Um, and the moon is only 400 kilometers away and Mars is 64 million kilometers away. So we need to up our game a little bit. Um, and then me at PNNL um, and personally, I've been thinking a lot about how these ambitious space activities and especially our goal to get to Mars are likely to increase the use and amounts of nuclear material in outer space. So I'd like to add a little bit of a policy perspective to start us off with today. Um, and the main question I wanna address is how do we ensure peaceful and responsible use of nuclear power for space? Um, what are the risks and how can we mitigate them now to really ensure we're gonna successfully pursue our space pro propulsion endeavors without any unintended consequences. So um, currently only nuclear weapon states like the US and Russia are uh, pursuing these nuclear uh, propulsion systems, but uh, we might as well in the long term see non-nuclear weapon state actors pursue these systems. And we also have increasingly commercial actors who are now actually the majority of um, actors who launch into space. And so with these new actors, I think we really need to talk about um, and think about what are the challenges that might be different to those we've had before and what are risks we should really be considering um, and mitigating at this point already. So there are a couple of legal framework and policy questions I wanna uh, briefly um, get your attention to. Number one, obviously safety, like we already said, launch failure um, is an issue, um, even though it might not, um, it might be not as big as compared to other types of uh, propulsion, uh, other types of nuclear stuff in the sky, but still we do wanna consider uh, what are the potential risks of using this type of fuel in a spa space reactor. And um, we do need to keep in mind that about 20% of launches, I believe, still have failures. So uh, that's just something to start us off with, uh, the safety aspect. And then the security aspect, which I'm really passionate about. Um, we have space reactors that pose two unique concerns. Um, so first, we have the, the incentive to actually use highly enriched uranium um, because it is simply lighter, you need less of it. And so that saves you a lot of technical difficulties. And this might be an option that more developing nations are interested in. Currently, the US government policy has been updated to focus on low or, or at least high assay, um, low enriched uranium, but um, other countries who might not have as highly developed um, uh, technological uh, possibilities, they might re revert back to the use of highly enriched uranium, be interested in that, pursue that. And that's really a big concern to me um, because that comes with a lot of safeguards and security concerns. Um, generally, it's been the US policy in the past to really make sure we're using low, low or low enriched uranium in the world. Um, get rid of that high enriched uranium, which just poses too many issues um, because it has this potential of 
being diverted and used for nuclear weapons. So that's that's one big concern. Um, and then the other point is that um, highly enriched uranium does pose more costs because of these security concerns. Um, it would be much more expensive to, to use it. So that's another reason why we're currently on the um, HALU track of using the more lower enriched uranium. Um, and the other final reason for that is really the pushback from the public, which often doesn't distinguish between different levels of enrichment and different levels of risk. And we, don't, we wanna make sure we still have the political support for our, our ambitions of that might include nuclear power in space. So um, I know I only have five minutes, but I'm more than happy to expand more on um, the concerns and the differences between the fuels um, that, I, that I've been thinking about and also how we might be able to mitigate those concerns um, nationally as well as internationally. So um, I think there's a lot of potential for the commercial sector and the government sector to work together here to find solutions to mitigate these risks. Um, and I'm really happy to talk about it more and also hear your ideas um, of the other panelists. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Jess, very interesting. Um, so now I think it, it, it's uh, gonna flow quite nicely if, uh, if Jeff, if you give your opening statement with your expertise in, in nuclear systems. So go ahead, please. Yeah, sure, Yuri. Uh, you know, I really got my start in space nuclear about 14 years ago through the Center for Space Nuclear Research at the Idaho National Laboratory. And you'll, you'll probably run into a, a number of people my age, maybe a little bit younger, who, who have a similar story. Uh, but there, I, I started out looking at plutonium-238 uh, production, radioized to a power systems, and high temperature energy conversion systems. And that eventually led me to do my PhD and my postdoc research looking at ways to process plutonium-238 in a way that decreases the hazards that are associated with that process, uh, particularly the stage that occurs at Los Alamos. Uh, but I'm also very interested in, in space reactors for power production. And since the uh, uh, rest of the, the panelists, I think, are maybe a little bit more specialized on nuclear thermal propulsion, I thought maybe I'd speak a little bit more about uh, space reactors and nuclear electric propulsion today. So I did want to mention a little bit about RTGs just to start. Uh, some of you may be familiar with radioisotope thermoelectric generators, which the U.S. has used to enable our space exploration missions and regimes where the solar power just isn't uh, strong enough. Uh, the RTGs, like Roger mentioned, produce on the order of tens or hundreds of watts electric to power spacecraft. Um, with maybe the exception of the uh, 1960s TRW Poodle thrusters, uh, that was the, uh, the little brother to the rover engine. Uh, radioisotopes really aren't used for propulsion systems. Our exploration missions like Voyager and Cassini and New Horizons didn't use their RTGs to power electric thrusters, but rather their onboard electronics and sensors. These missions use their initial launch vehicle energy and orbital mechanics maneuvers to accelerate them on their trajectories and then use chemical propulsion systems, mainly in the form of uh, hydrazine thrusters to fine tune their path and to orient their, uh, their sensors where they wanted to point. Uh, in the context of nuclear electric propulsion or NEP, I think that there's a lot of potential in the coming years. Uh, like Roger mentioned, most of the electric thrusters today are in the neighborhood of five kilowatts electric with some of them up to 10 kilowatts electric deployed in orbit. Uh, and higher power thrusters is not really a, a problem, but, but really where you see them being limited to five to 10 kilowatts is mostly based on the power that's available on the spacecraft today, rather than the, uh, the potential of the electric thrusters. So uh, these higher power thrusters, like the 100 kilowatt versions that uh, Roger mentioned are in development, uh, they could be used, but really they, they need a, uh, a power source. So in the, the nuclear electric concept, the reactor uh, is coupled to an energy conversion system with uh, heat rejection and then powers those electric thrusters. 
with the main benefit being that you can get very high uh, specific impulse. So a chemical rocket uh, specific impulse may be on the order of you know, 400, 425 seconds. Uh, while with nuclear thermal rockets, you may get somewhere around uh, 800 to 1,000 seconds. With, uh, with ion thrusters, you can get well over 1,000 or even thousands of seconds of ISP, uh, depending on the devices, uh, which makes these sort of the ultimate in the uh, space fuel economy for, for propulsion. Uh, <clears throat> so the issue is that uh, to date, only a handful of space reactors have been deployed, and all of their power levels were below 10 kilowatts electric. Uh, these prior systems were built and flown in the 1960s through the 80s, but today there's renewed momentum to deploy space reactors at power levels of 10 kilowatts and higher. In the U.S., the commercial sector is developing space reactor designs for applications such as a lunar base, and I've seen news articles about Russian work on a space reactor. So we may see space reactors being deployed this decade, but there are a lot of associated challenges, especially for power levels of hundreds of kilowatts electric or more, where the dynamic power conversion technologies are required and they have to operate reliably for years without maintenance, which is a real challenge in space. And if we deploy space reactors using HALU fuel, uh, there are gonna be some additional technologies that are needed uh, to be advanced to make them mass competitive with the HEU systems like Jessica alluded to. So I'll close by mentioning that there's been a lot of new policy related to space nuclear power, which I'm sure Jessica will discuss more if she has a chance, uh, which is exciting to see. And although the uh, president's budget proposal eliminates funding for vision-based space propulsion, I saw that both the House and the Senate proposed to continue funding it, and that the House appropriators directed NASA to allocate at least 10 million for nuclear electric propulsion based on the recent National Academies report that, that Roger led. So we may see some new NEP efforts directed at a Mars mission. Uh, so I, I think this is a, a very exciting time for space nuclear and uh, look forward to the, uh, the rest of the presentations in the panel and the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so again, I think this flows nicely into uh, into some of the work that Jake's been been doing um, with the uh, nuclear thermal and uh, and perhaps even applications for for fusion and and how hydrogen fits into both of those. Um, so Jake, would you like to give an opening statement? Sure. Thank you, Yuri. I, I prepared slides, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to make it real succinct and uh, try to get the message across real easily. I mean, when you look at the universe, you look up at the stars, okay, you're seeing light from burning hydrogen. It's 74% hydrogen by mass. If you think about hydrogen by number in the universe, I mean, it's far, far greater than that. So, and even here on earth, all chemical reactions, it's pondus hydrogeni, pH, the hydrogen potential that drives them. So I really think the logistical challenge, the storage and distribution of hydrogen, that's the biggest opportunity for space or clean energy here on Earth um, in space. Okay, whether you're running a chemical rocket, a nuclear fission rocket, a fusion rocket, or if you just wanna have a good moderator to keep from the spa you know, space radiation, liquid hydrogen is where you wanna be, but, it's always been the logistics that have been prevented us from using it as a fuel. The SR-71, originally designed to fly on hydrogen. It, hydrogen burns better in a turbine, but we could not get liquefiers distributed around the world to everywhere we would need to refuel the SR-71. Um, and, and so I get really frustrated today when I hear these challenges of we're going to try to produce hydrogen for a buck a kilogram by the end of the next decade. We've always been able to produce massive amounts of hydrogen. It's always been our ability to store and distribute it that's the issue. If you look, if you had a hundred million dollars, put it down on the table today to say, I want the best hydrogen liquefier money could buy, you would get a system Basically, that's 1970s technology that is operating less than 30% of what is theoretically achievable. 
Okay, and moreover, it can't scale down to be something useful for space rockets. Okay, um, and you know, you think about how many areas this impacts and that we haven't had a research program in this area in the US for 30 years, 40 years. You can see why we're running into all of these issues and challenges we can't figure out. Uh, so anyhow, what we do and what we're doing about it in my lab right now, we're really focused on two things. Efficient, scalable hydrogen liquefaction. We just completed the build of the first deployable hydrogen liquefier that you can drop on a beachfront anywhere in the world you want to, plug in electricity and water, you have liquid hydrogen, okay? Um, we're looking at scaling that up developing much more efficient hydrogen liquefier concepts. We have two that we're trying to find anybody to fund um, because there isn't a program we can go to at the federal level that's set up to fund this kind of thing. The one that was trying to get set up can't get interest at the federal level. Um, but anyhow, we're making those. Um, we're also looking at liquid hydrogen storage. So changing the paradigms. If you put liquid hydrogen in space, it's not gonna settle to the bottom of a tank on its own. It's gonna be all over the place. You're gonna have heat leak, thermal soak from your nuclear hydrogen rocket you know, motor burning in the back that's heating up your tank. It's gonna boil. You're gonna have to vent a lot of it. When the Saturn V folks wanted to go to the moon, they had just a few hours to decide to make the jump to the moon because the boil off rate in their tanks was so high that if they waited, they wouldn't have the fuel to make it there. Today, it's the same problem. It's almost the exact same liquid hydrogen storage configuration going in the SLS, okay? Technology has changed. <laughs> we can make things so much differently than we have in the past, okay? Yet still, we're trying to fly liquid hydrogen storage concepts that were pioneered in the 1980s just to test them that have been on the backlog for that long. So this is where we're coming in in the lab. We're, we're developing 3D printed liquid hydrogen tanks. We did that for drones. Um, it, it, some of the polymer composites that are coming out have a specific strength, like two and a half times higher than any of the metallics, but there are no property data out there just to decide how these materials perform in liquid hydrogen. Um, so we're trying to do the measurements that way, but that even there, you're not getting really a lot of hydrogen per weight. So, we figured out we could do something even better. We've got these bladders, okay? Literally, literally origami thin film polymer bladders that everybody thought when NASA studied this in the 1960s, they shatter. No, you just have to fold them right. And you can cycle these thousands of times. And moreover, you can make them double walled. We vacuum form them and you can cool the liquid hydrogen inside of these and you don't even need a metal tank anymore. So. These are some of the things that we're working on. Um, I'll, and I'll wrap it up with this. If you're interested in this, we have hiring opportunities, openings at just about every level through the organization. Check out the jobs post um, here on the Whoever app. And uh, uh, we need all the help we can get at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Very interesting. So now we'll turn over to, to Josh, who I think has some very interesting ideas about how to how to provide space power. So Josh, would you like to make an opening statement? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm just gonna give you a little sense of some of the work that we do. It's kind of adjacent really to the topics here, uh, less to do with propulsion specifically and more about the distribution and management of power for space applications. Uh, so we've been working for many years on inductive power transfer uh, and uh, in particular, there's a startup called Wybotic that my student Ben Waters uh, and I founded that spun out of the lab to commercialize some of this work. Uh, recently, we've started working with Astrobotic uh, <clears throat> for a specific project called uh, NASA, through NASA's Tipping Point Project, which aims to demonstrate wireless charging of these cube rovers like you see here on the right on the moon. Um, this is in conjunction with the Peregrine lander that you see on the left that Astrobotic will be flying to the moon uh, soon. Um, so this picture kind of outlines the, the project. Uh, so you have, you know, power sources such as, uh, you know, solar on the moon. You have uh, base stations that are, you know, 
sources of inductive power. And then uh, these little cube rovers can move around, do their thing. In particular, uh, one of the goals is to be able to survive the lunar night, which you know lasts three weeks. Uh, so it wouldn't necessarily be feasible for these cube rovers to carry their own batteries, but by having a larger uh, uh, power system and then distributing the power easily, uh, inductively, uh, you can do more. Uh, this is also kind of, there are other adjacent things going on in this space. So NASA has a Watts on the Moon uh, project that, you know, Astrobotic is involved with and some of these other collaborators. Uh, so uh, they're looking at a variety of uh, ways to distribute power on the moon, including, uh, you know, beamed power solutions. Uh, there's also the NASA VSAT, Vertical Solar Array Technologies, program that's going on. So this is uh, aiming to, you know, build arrays of these, these vertical co configurations um, for, uh, for these applications. Um, so one of the specific challenges we're looking at with the Tipping Point project is, you know, will the regolith be heated uh, by the, you know, the inductive charging? Uh, so that's one of the things we'll be studying. Uh, the other thing, which actually Wybotic is also involved with, which sort of ties into some of what Jake is talking about, is uh, uh, in situ resource utilization. So uh, we're working on this. Well, Wybotic and Astrobotic are working on the RAZOR, which stands for Regolith Advanced Surface Systems Operation Robot. So the idea is that this robot will go around, collect dust uh, on Mars or, or the moon, uh, and then it will be uh, separated into hydrogen and oxygen, or hydrogen and oxygen will be extracted from it. Uh, and then that can be carried off and used as fuel. Now, of course, that doesn't solve the problem of where does that energy come from, but it's, it's more of a distribution issue, which kind of ties into some of what Jake's, Jake's talking about. So our part of it is related to, you know, if you have this dust process, dust handling robot, it's, it's going to be very dusty. And so how does that robot the, the razor actually get power so we've been evaluating uh down at kennedy space center which is where this video was shot they've evaluated uh, wireless charging of the razor uh system so hopefully that will go further so that's all i wanted to say for my introduction uh, looking forward to the rest of the panel great thank you josh very interesting um, so, Roger, did you want to add anything in terms of an opening statement? Uh, not really, I, other than to, to just uh, emphasize the points that uh, Jessica and Jeff made about the challenges of fission reactors. You know, I actually work with NASA some right now on their various programs, and they're uh, really focused on the high assay, low enriched, the LEU approach for the reasons that Jessica Jessica mentioned. And there's a big effort now to establish a testing approach uh, for both, for either an EP or NTP, the electric or the thermal options that is a credible way of qualifying and certifying for human missions. When you think about the requirements for these very big systems for crude applications for human missions, uh, the reliability requirements are extreme, which, which results in very extreme testing requirements. And that is exactly as, they, as both uh, Jessica and Jeff said, a big challenge uh, for fission, for fission based. It's a, frankly a challenge for any uh, of these large systems, but fission based systems um, in particular. It's part of the reason that NASA is really focused on the high assay, low in, the low enriched uh, approach for that. Um, and for example, making sure that when you launch you know, the production systems, when you launch them, they're launched cold. Uh, but there's still the issue, for example, if there is a launch vehicle failure and you have an intact reactor that enters the water, there's a, the ocean that lands in the ocean, there's, you know, you got to have criticality safety uh, features, et cetera. And those designs are all sort of underway at, at a relatively low level. But, 
you know, in Seattle, we have, you know, ultra safe nuclear um, in Virginia, there's BWXT and, you know, there, there are several companies, there's in California, there's General Atomics. There are various companies now that are, uh, that NASA is funding to develop um, these, to do the early phase of development of these systems. So we're making progress. And I'm particularly excited by the fusion work that is uh, continuing to emerge um, and that you're involved with, Yuri. Uh, so, um, and finally, I'd just like to say we shouldn't discount the possibility of solar power systems, right? We have the ISS flying at 200 kilowatts and that only has a 13% efficient solar cells. Today's solar cells are three times that efficiency. So to get the equivalent power, you'd have a third the size of the arrays. So thinking about a 500 kilowatt solar system is not, it is something we should continue to think about. It's very complex. The packaging is very challenging, but we should continue to think about it. So I look forward to the discussion. Um, I actually, I, I love Josh's comments about wireless charging, the, the challenges of uh, operating rovers and even for the fission surface power systems, for example, how do you get close to them after they've been operating for a long period of time on the surface of the moon, for example, that's a, a real challenge today. So enough said, we can move on to Q&A. Great. Thank you, Roger. Um, so I, I did want to uh, throw out a question. So I mean, I, I, we've been focusing on, on nuclear uh, power, which is, is also my interest. Um, but, but I do also want to uh, bring up maybe the, uh, the, the other facet, maybe another facet, which is, you know, as, as environmental awareness and concerns have, have increased, is that pushing towards uh, finding non-nuclear options for, for power? So, so Roger, you talked about uh, new solar panels and, and there's certainly been development of, of solar panels for terrestrial power. Um, are there opportunities to leverage that um, for, for space power, at least for, for local space power, or maybe as you described it, AU less than one sort of uh, missions? So Roger, maybe you can say uh, Sure, I mean, actually new solar panel technology, new solar arrays, new solar cells are continuously being invested in for terrestrial applications. Although for terrestrial applications, the efficiency requirements and the mass requirements are not nearly as, as extreme. I mean, 10 years ago, 15 years, let's see, when I entered the business, you know, I have lots of gray now, so it was a long time ago. Nobody ever thought we would be flying solar, solar missions to Jupiter. Well, now we've, we're flying two, right? We, uh, Lucy just launched and we have uh, Juno, which launched several years ago. So it's clear that the, and that's to Jupiter, let alone Mars. Right. So uh, the penalties associated with going extra solar are decreasing as solar, solar technology advances, solar and battery technology, don't forget the batteries. Um, but they are still extreme. And one of the big challenges, for example, for the lunar surface is that the lunar night is two weeks long. And if you scale batteries to work for two weeks, they get to be enormous. And you just can't, it, the mass trades just don't, don't work very well. Uh, in addition, when you look at overall architecture reliability for crewed missions, you need backup systems that are very reliable uh, and for, for surface power. Uh, and so the question is, how do you arrange a large enough set of large solar systems with their batteries to deal with on the moon a two week night or on Mars a one week night, but with a lot less um, because of the distance to Mars and the challenges of communication, there are other reliability factors that, that need to be assessed when thinking about power systems. So um, the advances in solar array technology in my mind are very exciting because they are non-nuclear, so they don't carry the regulatory challenges, but there are some missions where that just won't work, and at least not today. And so we really do need investment in fission systems for, um, you know, to enable mi new missions that we haven't been able to do, uh, crewed missions to Mars um, 
or lunar, staying the lunar, having a permanent presence on the surface of the moon. Uh, you know, there are architectures, uh, solar architectures that might work that might, for example, use some of the beam, be a combination of solar plus beamed to get the energy down into a permanently shadowed region of the moon. But, you know, so anyway, those are my, that, that's a quick, quick answer. Right. Yeah. So, you know, in discussing kind of the evolution of, of, of technology, which has certainly evolved in significant ways, um, certainly policy issues have also evolved. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think in particular, the last few years, things have changed quite rapidly. Um, so, so maybe, Jess, can you describe how, how some of the U.S. policies have, have developed and, and also in, in the context of, of how um, there are uh, international legal considerations regarding uh, nuclear energy in the space? Yeah, happy to. So let me start off by saying the rules have developed, but there's still a lot of a lot of need to catch up with technological development and constantly reassess um, where we're going, uh, what the risks are, what we need to address now, so that companies can prepare for these measures. Um, so, just going back real quick, the long-standing U.S. policy for particularly um, nuclear um, was to reduce the use of highly enriched uranium. And that's something that's really important, I think, for space propulsion um, uh, because we might, um, we've invested a lot as a country into making sure that other countries also go away from highly enriched uranium, have helped them use low enriched uranium. And so that's one, one big uh, thing that has been addressed again more recently with regard to space nuclear power. So in 2020, um, I think this was the last space policy directive, space policy directive six of the Trump administration. Um, the administration decided to limit the use of highly enriched uranium fuel to um, applications for which mission would not be viable with other nuclear fuels or non-nuclear power sources. So that was some, I think, one of the biggest um, developments that we've seen in recent years that now I don't think it's really possible to justify um, for US operations the use of highly enriched uranium anymore unless um, there is really a huge need and you can't really close out a mission with lower enriched uranium. Um, so the, the weight, the costs, performance advantages would really have to um, be rather big. And so that, that's been a big difference and um, a change because um, NASA was a little bit looking into the highly enriched uranium fuel reactor. So I think that's, that's what I see as one of the big changes in US policy. Um, and then also we had um, a little bit more attention coming to, to the regulatory space. In 2019, there was a presidential memorandum on launch of spacecraft uh, containing space nuclear systems, and that revised the launch approval process. Um, and we saw here a little bit of uh, this, this consideration to balance regulatory requirements with commercial desires to raise capital and um, also to market these systems to, to foreign customers. So the launch approval process was uh, reformed, I would say in part to support this commercial development um, through a more tiered structure and establishing more of a pathway for commercial launches um, to be regulated by the Department of Transportation. Th those were the two big, I think, policy developments in the US and then internationally, I think there's still a lot to catch up on. International law obviously applies to space and IAEA safeguards will apply um, to any nuclear materials used in these, in these reactors. But then there's instances where I still see a lot of need to catch up on um, because you can't really reach um, the fuel once it's up in space and just monitoring what happens with it there is a whole other story. So we'll have to develop some probably technologically innovative solutions to make sure that our safeguards are effective. 
and also for nuclear security in general. Um, but we do um, have the principles relevant to the use of nuclear power sources in outer space. So that was the UN General Assembly resolution. Those aren't typically um, generally binding, but still something that states should follow. And those were largely focused on safety rather than security. So I still see a lot of need here to catch up um, since they really focus more on safety, giving notice, emergency assistance and damages. Um, yeah, so my conclusion I think would be there's still a lot of need for policy development. Sure, sure. Great, thank you. So, so Jeff, you know, so just touched on the, uh, the development of, of commercial applications and, and we've certainly seen commercial space become more relevant um, in the past few years. How do you see opportunities to apply RTGs or even uh, nuclear fission um, for, for commercial space? And, and how do you think that um, complicates things or does it actually uh, provide new opportunities for, for improving the technology? Yeah, thanks for that question. You know, it, it's really pretty interesting. If you look at how things were organized under the SP100 program, they divided up a lot of the technical aspects of that among the national laboratories for development. But today, as you see NASA issuing uh, these calls and, and also DARPA, they're not going to the national laboratories, they're going to the industry. And so uh, I, I think it's sort of a emerging uh, environment for commercial actors to be uh, developing and implementing um, both RPS as well as space reactor uh, systems, whether that's um, you know nuclear thermal propulsion or space reactors for, for power at large. Um, so, you know, I, I think that this is something that's going to continue to expand. Um, and it will be interesting to see how that market evolves and, and where it goes. Uh, but I, I do think that that's one of the most exciting aspects of space nuclear power in general right now is the uh, increased involvement of the commercial sector. And now regarding the uh, uh, fuel enrichment aspect of that, um, in my mind, that's one of the drivers behind the use of HALU fuel is that I think it makes it simpler for commercial entities uh, to be significant players in space reactors because it would be a lot simpler for them uh, to manage HALU fuels as opposed to highly enriched uranium. And with respect to RTGs, uh, I think it'd be challenging for commercial entities to work with plutonium-238 uh, but they can likely uh, successfully work with alternative radioisotope power systems using different isotopes. Great, thank you, Jeff. So, um, so Jake, I mean, you you touched on the challenges of, of storing hydrogen um, for, you know, at least in my mind, a relatively short mission to the moon. Um, what what are the challenges for storing hydrogen for deep space missions, where you have to store um, for you know, many years, um, and and also if, if I could get your thoughts on on how is storing hydrogen different than storing helium? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Yuri. So the my friends at NASA Glenn uh, came out and gave a talk a few years back about their design for a, a liquid hydrogen uh, thermal thermal nuclear rocket to go to Mars. And the amount of cryocooler technology they would need and the amount of power they would need to cool that liquid hydrogen to prevent from venting hydrogen continuously into space on your way to the Mars it was just not even feasible. We we're talking orders of magnitude away from being close uh, mm -hmm. to doing this. Now, the thing is though, physical law allows that technology to be improved substantially to the point where just a, a solar panel array mm -hmm. could allow for efficient enough cooling to have zero boil off. Um, I, I don't know how far out away from the sun you could do that, but for quite a, quite a ways. And that same cooling technology that enables zero boil off also enables efficient liquefiers to work. 
So it's one thing that can solve both challenges, the liquefaction and the storage, but we need more programs looking at how you can cool that hydrogen very efficiently. Now, this is where it gets interesting comparing helium to hydrogen. A lot of people don't realize that helium and hydrogen are more quantum than classical fluids. They're, they're, they have a thermal de Broglie wavelength that can be many times larger there, they, than the average distance of interaction, even in the gas phase. And that presents new opportunities for kinds of technologies that we haven't even envisioned yet um, because we can't do it with classical fluids and systems at room temperature. So that's where we need more basic measurements. We need more people researching on this, the low TRL stuff, because you're not gonna find people in industry that can really do this well, because there isn't even measurements for them to design a system from. So that's an opportunity that we really need some basic research in the, in the national labs and in academia to start helping us out with, and we need the federal programs to start supporting that. Great, thanks, Jake. So, it, and you know, speak, my interest, of course, in, in helium is, is helium-3 and, and deuterium for, for fusion reactors. And, and so, so Josh, in, in your slides, you described um, mining the regolith um, for, for hydrogen, but one of the speculations is that it's also quite rich in helium-3. Um, what, what are the, the possibilities of, of extracting helium-3 and, and really using that as, as the source for, for a fusion rocket, maybe even the launch pad from, for, for fusion uh, devices? Yeah, unfortunately, I think you probably know more about that than I do. I, I, I don't have much to add there. But, uh, you know, I, I was just curious to follow up with, with Jake. So the, the properties of these liquids, I mean, is it that the viscosity is, uh, you know, very strange or what, what are the unusual properties that you end up with? Yeah, viscosity is one of them. Helium-3 will go super fluid, just like helium-4 will at, at certain temperatures. And that enables a whole neat cadre of devices. I mean, liquid hydrogen, it won't go super fluid, but it still has the lowest viscosity of any of the regular fluids, which presents its own challenges and opportunities. You just have to think differently when working with some of these fluids. So yeah, if, if you're mining the moon for helium-3, I'm all about designing a helium-3 liquefier and storage tank. I'll help you out with that. I mean, <laughs> I would... <laughs> that's ahead, crazy. I, sorry, I wanted to add one thing to that. Because the studies that I've seen of fusion systems for Mars missions indicate that we don't, that there's actually plenty of helium. Helium-3 is produced today on the Earth in small quantities. The beauty of a fusion system is you don't need very much to do a pretty amazing mission. So in fact, if you look at the production rates of terrestrial helium-3, that is enough to do many Mars missions. Uh, crude Mars, big Mars missions, right? So yes, Yuri, I totally agree with you that it'd be wonderful to mine helium-3 on the moon. And I hope Josh is successful and manages to, to have that. But we don't have to do it for the first several missions, right? We can, we can proceed if we are successful in developing the technology, figuring out how to, how to build fusion propulsion systems, we can do the Mars missions. And luckily they're fast enough so that we don't have to invoke all of Jake's fancy uh, long-term storage because you only have to store it for much shorter periods of time. You will need some, absolutely. Yes, Jake, we need you. Uh <laughs> we'll see who solves their problems first. How about exactly. that? Exactly, <laughs> yes, I agree. Good, good, good point. <laughs> this, this is a great discussion. Um, I think we've got a couple of minutes. Maybe we can take some questions from the audience. Mm. We can do a couple of minutes, but then if you, if the panelists can answer things on Whova, that would be awesome too. Yes, thank you, Christy. Um, so Amy, do you have, um, can you have a, read a question from the audience, please? I can, um, let's see, Anna, can you connect? She signed in again, but I can certainly take it. Oh, are you ready, Anna? Yeah, you're good. Uh, you're, you've been answering, asking most of these questions actually in a, in a relatively, um, reasonable format um, just with your interest. But I guess the top rated question is what policy or political changes should be made to advance the research, commercial work and scaling of highly experimental nuclear power systems. I mean, we've kind of been discussing that. But if anyone has any other thoughts. Now, Jess, would you like to take that one? Sure, sure. Thanks for the question. Um, 
Yeah, so there are a couple of uh, policy and legal changes that are definitely already being discussed in the international community. Um, and so with regard to safety, um, the like I said, the, the principles from the UN General Assembly resolution, they're not binding. And so this really hinges on um, national implementation on this becoming national law and these principles being spelled out more. So they're very broad. Um, they do recognize that nuclear power sources in outer space should be based on a thorough safety assessment, including you know, risk analysis and um, all these considerations like accidental exposures. Um, and so the, I think the real crux is how to, how to formalize these uh, risk assessments, how to formalize these risk analyses um, and determine more in licensing conditions and regulations what, what risk we're, we're um, willing to accept. So, so that's definitely a big challenge um, for any regulatory agency in the US and outside of the US. Um, and then looking at um, more general international law, I think there is definitely the, the IAEA safeguards um, question of how do we, I think I, re I already touched on this, how do we um, make sure that we account for shipping, testing, um, and launch um, safeguards during those times, which aren't um, usually in place for more traditional uh, reactors that we have on the ground, right? So, so there's really these considerations where I think we need to speak, the technical community needs to uh, speak uh, to the policymakers and to, to the legal people and really make sure that we understand how we can reach uh, solutions that are risk-based and smart and allow the commercial sector to, to advance and for us to eventually reach Mars um, while also uh, making sure we don't accept any um, risks that are disproportional. Great, thank you, Jeff. So if I can hop on that too, Yuri, uh, from, okay. the, from the technology side, I think what is needed, uh, especially to support commercial development and, and long-term deployment is for the government to have a, a sustained fundamental R&D program particularly in materials that are pertinent to space nuclear power systems uh, and propulsion systems. Uh, these are technologies and, and areas that aren't necessarily developed for other purposes in some cases. And uh, having a sustained program to advance those is something that I think is gonna be important in the long term. Thanks for that addition, Jeff, that's really helpful. Um, so I, I think with that, we'll wrap up our, our panel session. Um, I'd like to give my, uh, my heartfelt uh, thank you to all the panelists uh, for a wonderful conversation. Um, really interesting discussion. I really enjoyed it. Um, and, um, and for the uh, audience uh, questions, um, I'd invite the panelists to please go to, to the uh, application and, uh, and respond to, the, uh, to their questions. Um, and with that, we'll bring our session to a close. Um, thank you again very much. Thank you, Yuri. It was a great session. And thank you to all of my colleagues, fellow panelists. Thanks, everyone.